Are you a successful barrister yet fall into the trap of equating constant work with success? Is your relentless drive leaving you feeling lonely, overworked, and somewhat lost in your well-being journey because you are so busy with your workload? When you finally have time to relax, do you find yourself feeling guilty instead of feeling relaxed? If these questions resonate with you, you are not alone. In today's episode, I am excited to welcome Adam Pipe, a barrister specializing in immigration, asylum, and human rights law at Number 8 Chambers in Birmingham. Adam is not just a successful leading barrister, but also a biohacker and health and well-being enthusiast who has his very own YouTube channel. Adam's insights offer a very unique perspective for barristers and show you how you can continue to thrive in your legal career while optimizing your personal well-being. Enjoy the show. Adam, welcome to the show. I'm so happy for you to be my guest today. After being on your channel and being interviewed by you, it's really an honor for you to be my guest. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Charlene. It's a real privilege to join you today. It's a bit obviously strange with the tables being turned. I'm used to the one asking the questions of people. So yeah, that's fantastic. No, thank you for having me on today. And speaking of table being turned, one of the reasons uh, amongst many I admire what you do so much, Adam, is you are one of those very few barristers who have their own dedicated YouTube channel. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I suppose firstly, I appreciate your audience is probably spans the globe and there would be people who are not used to the the British legal system and the whole idea that you don't just have lawyers, you have solicitors and barristers, and traditionally a client would instruct a solicitor who would then use a barrister for advocacy in court or written work or grounds of appeal. And a lot of barristers are, are very traditional in the way they approach things. So business development, uh, I, in fact, I was involved in an interview this week, interviewing a new barrister, and he, he was working at the moment in a solicitor's firm, and he was talking about BD And my clerks, all barristers have clerks, and my, my clerks were like, what's BD? So they didn't understand about <laughs> business development and marketing. So a lot of barristers have not been very good at, at doing that. And I suppose one of the things, uh, as your audience may know, and uh, uh, that I'm an immigration barrister specializing in immigration, asylum, and human rights. And one of the things I've done, and perhaps reflecting before our conversation today, is to set myself apart and to do something different Uh, what I've tried to do is update my solicitors, so it's solicitors who are the main source of my work, on changes to the law. So immigration law in the United Kingdom is one of the fastest changing areas of law, I think because it's subject to such political pressure. So through developing first, you know, a good old fashioned email mailing list, I think some sometimes these days people think, oh, email mailing lists are so passe and they're something of the past. But actually, just when there's been a new development in like last week, we're recording this in November 23. Last week, the Supreme Court in the United Kingdom handed down the big judgment on whether people can be sent to Rwanda for their asylum claims to be dealt with. So sending out a summary of that judgment. And then I did a, a YouTube video, in fact, a YouTube short. That's my latest thing. See if you can say things in one minute. But so I use my YouTube channel to, to d highlight developments in the law. But then I think particularly during COVID time, I realized that professionals, as everybody else, were facing unique challenges. I, I know your speciality, Charlene, is in terms of burnout. Uh, and what I started to do is through contacts and colleagues, start interviewing people and having conversations to discuss these issues. Because, uh, as I've said, particularly barristers, they're very traditional. They perhaps don't think about these sort of things. So it was something to open that up. In fact, at the start of lockdown, I remember asking one of my yoga teachers to record a 20 minute yoga sequence that I could put on my YouTube channel. So if you go on my YouTube channel, there's plenty of stuff about the Supreme Court deciding something. Then there's a, a 20 minute session of, of yoga for people. So, yeah, that's a bit about what, what I do on, on YouTube. Well, one of the things I would like to highlight straight away is 
not so many barristers could make the claim that you do Maine that you have a dedicated yoga teacher. So I love that already, <laughs> Adam. And this is exactly the reason you are on the show today. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more. What, what did it for you? What was the source of the inspiration to navigate this traditional profession, of course, being a barrister and having this desire and having this inspiration and this creativity to launch that YouTube channel and to use BD terms and a novel marketing medium? Yeah, I suppose one of my passions is learning and communicating what I learn to others. So I suppose in the area of law I do, particularly in immigration, I quite I quite like cases where my client doesn't say a word <laughs> because that'll just ruin things for me. But actually, I can find a way of winning the case through learning something about the law and then presenting my, my legal arguments. And it's the same part. A lot of what I do is involved in training events. So tomorrow I've got a live webinar where I'm teaching solicitors about recent developments in the law. So I love learning and communicating what I've learned. And I suppose for those watching, you know, doing something like a personality test, I, I remember doing something like Strength Finder to think about what are my strengths. Well, actually, I have a passion for learning, a passion for teaching and equipping others. So that, that spans across what I do in terms of my legal practice, but then also in communicating. So I, I grew up in South Wales. People can probably tell through my, my accent. I grew up in the church, so I was used to sort of fiery Welsh preachers speaking <laughs> and preaching. So that that passion for communicating and also enjoy doing things like dr drama as a child. So I think it's it's that sort of passion and combining that passion for communicating. Perhaps I've noticed, actually, I, I'm an only child and I think there's a lot of barristers who are only children. And I think there's perhaps that, that trait of only children liking to perform. But, yeah, so it's that performance element combined then with the learning and particularly something like IT immigration law, which is is something that is, as I said, constantly changing. So the developments are so fast moving and, and to, you know, be up to date with the law in order so I can be the best barrister I can, but also... Part of my passion is to equip others to be the best that they can in their profession. I think for anybody who knows immigration in the UK, as I've said, it's it's a, a hot political topic and it's often beset by poor quality legal advice to some of the most vulnerable members of society. You know, as I reflect back on my clients, a lot of them have experienced huge trauma or are suffering mental breakdown and, and psychosis And I think people who are the most, you know, it, it says a lot about society, how we treat our most vulnerable members of society. Mm. And I think they deserve the best advocates possible. You probably know from studying law yourself, some of the best and the brightest are encouraged to go into commercial and magic circle firms and the like. Mm. Actually, I think there's a need for some of the best and the brightest to be working with the the least and those who struggle the most. So, yeah, those that I don't know if that answers your question, but it's sort of combining those passions Absolutely. in my practice, but also to, to equip others as well. And I can really relate to what you said, because I remember being at Cambridge and attending a lot of law fairs. And as a top student, you really get this promotion really heavily from law firms. In fact, law firms are really <laughs> promoted and sponsored by law firms. And there is a huge appeal, right, to join those magic law firms and mm. to be part of that club. And I was also reflecting on, on this path as I was preparing for our conversation today and, and reflecting on how, if it was up to you, Adam, how would you promote, if I may use that word, Becoming a barrister or choosing the path of being a barrister to young talents that may be listening to us today. And perhaps they are at law school and perhaps they are soon to graduate and they are tempted by this magic circle and they want to be a solicitor. What would you say to them? Firstly, there's nothing wrong with being a commercial solicitor and doing that. So, so Indeed, first, for anyone you know, listening, we love, we love yeah, our solicitors. Before everybody starts emailing me, uh, yeah. And, And, and often I'll get emails and people who want to come and shadow and are at that early stage of their career. I think one of the th things that I've already talked about 
a few times is passion. You know, I, I see, you know, I, I've got a daughter who's just about to apply to university. And I think a lot of people in her uh, school are pushed to go into things like medicine and law. You know, those people, when I see people who are interested in a career in law, I firstly want to know that they're passionate about doing that. I, I think for me, um, passion is important. Um, perhaps it's my Welsh roots, but, you know, somebody who's actually really wants it because it is a difficult career to get into. I, I know as our conversation goes on, we'll perhaps talk about the struggles professionally and the challenges for things like burnout. Uh, and it is something that demands a lot of us. It, you know, it needs that intellectual rigor as well. And, and that that's what we're looking for. But also it's something that can make a huge difference, you know, in people's lives. And I think across the different areas of law, you know, I think there's a huge need for people in areas such as, as human rights law to, to have, you know, really talented individuals. So, and there's nothing more exciting, I think, you know, when, when we talk later, perhaps about burnout, I think a lot of barristers perhaps live off that adrenaline of the court performance. I talked about mm. wanting to be a performer growing up. And I think there's a huge ad adrenaline spike when you're performing in court. Uh, and, you know, there's the the nerves, the emotion, the drama of it all. Uh, and I think there is that um, adrenaline uh, of it. Now, that has its downsides because people can can look for those in perhaps the wrong places then. <laughs> But actually, there's no, there's nothing like you know that that the, the court drama and standing on your feet to to represent your client. So, yeah, that's perhaps how I'd sell it. And what was it for you, Adam, that drew you to the profession and specifically to becoming a barrister? Yeah, I, I suppose um, my uh, talking to my my parents the other day, my mother joked that I wanted to be a, a dustman, a bin man, a refuse collector, and then a barrister. So I don't know how that jump was made, but I, but I. I and, and I probably didn't know much about it because I'm the first person in my family to go to university. There's no sort of long history. I went to a, a comprehensive school, which in the 80s, that was the sort of, you know, nothing special. Um, uh, but it, 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 I, I must have found it through through watching on TV, then having that passion to, you know, speak, uh, uh, and but also loving that learning side uh, uh, and develop that that passion to be a, a barrister and it was always the bar it was it was that courtroom advocacy that that attracted me certainly and was that fed by any show that you watched growing up or was yeah, that I, fed by tv uh, because i hear this quite often right that sometimes we watch those courtroom shows and mm, they draw us to the profession i suppose when when i grew up so I, I, I was in secondary school probably in the late 80s early 90s there was an old tv program called rumpole of the bailey which was this old crusty criminal barrister so i probably watched that i suppose from the american side there was la law but i don't i, I don't know if i you know la law is my thing so yeah i i, I wonder if it if it's things like that i don't know whoever sort of dropped that seed in my mind of becoming a barrister because but then it was was all I wanted to do really mm. and you said something really interesting about being an only child and perhaps how that might be a psychological explanation for the drive mm. or desire to join the profession I found that and please do do share more insights whether you agree or not. I found that one of the big steer on whether or not to decide to become a solicitor or a barrister initially was the appeal of that teamwork and being part of a wider firm and being part of a wider team. At least for me, that's really what attracted me most to the idea of being a solicitor. There was no question that I wanted to be a, a litigator. I always, always wanted to be a litigator. But for me, the idea of having a semi-solitary career as a barrister was something that was quite turned off because I wanted to be part of a team and wanted to be part of a firm. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, certainly. So again, for those who perhaps are not familiar with the, the English legal system, barristers traditionally have been self-employed. So I'm, I'm a self-employed sole practitioner, but barristers work in barristers' chambers. Uh, so that will be a group of barristers who are all self-employed but work together and have clerks who will then, uh, they will contact the solicitors in terms of work. Um, but you're an individual, so very much you are your own boss. How I, when and how I prepare for my case is a matter for me. Um, but equally, 
you've got that collegiality that the, the bar has traditionally been about barristers working together, but speaking to each other about their cases, running their cases by each other. Um, so you're not working together in a team as such, although sometimes bigger cases will involve multiple barristers working together. Um, but you are that individual self-employed, but hopefully having that collegiality. So in chambers, you know, after court barristers will come back, they'll talk about their cases, they'll discuss ongoing cases and run cases by each other. Although post-COVID, you know, physically, Chambers actually is quite a desolate place. So when I go there, my my clerks are there. A couple of other barristers may pop in or out, but it, it's very much quiet. So navigating that collegiality in a post-COVID world, I think, is a challenge. Yes, you know, I've set up a WhatsApp group for our, our team in, in Chambers and we communicate there, but it, it doesn't replace that. So how how that face-to-face interaction with other members of the cha- of chambers, because I think both professionally, uh, um, you know, being able to discuss cases with, with other barristers in terms of, you know, getting their insights on the law or ethical questions of how you should ethically deal with with a case is so important. But also just that, that you know, th- th- I think there is an epidemic within the professions perhaps of loneliness. Uh, I, I think that that... That is a real challenge for people, you know, going on because you can be, you can do your case, you can go into court. I, I talk to people who sit as judges and I think some people who sit as part-time judges are similar. They'll go go in, their clerk will take them into court, they'll deal with the case, then they'll be up in their chambers on their own. And I think I, I think a lot of professions, especially post, post-COVID, are experiencing that ep- epidemic of loneliness. So Absolutely. the bar is a self-employed profession can be particularly challenging in that respect I think. Have you managed to overcome that potential feeling of loneliness and and what have you seen in others in terms of experiencing and navigating that feeling of loneliness? I think for me one of the things I've tried to do is sort of you know open up avenues of communication whether it's through WhatsApp whether it's you know through uh, different events but also perhaps organizing get-togethers of of practitioners so they can get together in a social setting to discuss legal developments but also you know just to have that personal contact as well I, I, I'm not saying I've got that nailed down completely because you know there are times when you still miss that sort of interaction with people and having that I'm used to and I enjoy being self-employed and that's part of why I chose the bar because you are responsible for arguing your client's case and 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 doing the, the, the preparations so there's still those things I love about it but I'm just cognizant of those challenges that come particularly post-covid of having keeping up those relationships both professionally in terms of you know iron sharpening iron that when you you bump into each other and you discuss matters it it improves you as a practitioner but also of that social side as well Mm. and you've mentioned as well this performing right in court and how attractive that can be Mm. because of course you can really fall in love with the feeling of performance but of course, there is a flip side, right? There is the performance anxiety, there is the performance nerve, there is also the after, because mm. after the performance, there is also a, a low, right? You've gone this yeah. high, you've got all the adrenaline, the cortisol, and then there is a bit of a drop. At least I feel it uh, after a state of the beach, big performance. I feel this this drop for a moment. You just need a, almost a day to integrate and, and what now and what next, right? Because there was such mm. a high. Can you tell us more about what that looks like and feels like as a barrister going in and out of court. Certainly. I think taking your first point about the pre sort of court anxiety, I suppose the first thing I'd want to say is that anxiety in one sense can be a good thing Mm -hmm. um, that a certain level of anxiety. So I would hope when I prepare for court and I've got a big case coming up that I am a bit nervous if I'm not, I'd be a bit worried, you know, about whether I've prepared properly and are taking this matter, you know, seriously. So I think there is a a good side because those who perhaps are too laid back, you know, do you care enough? Have you prepared enough? But equally, then there can be that that where anxiety becomes, you know, challenging. It's not 
I, I know we're recording this and I don't want to get too too personal, but you could, you know, before a big case, you can spend quite a few, a lot of time in the toilet before, oh, you, you know. I, I hear this a lot <laughs> as part of my coaching practice. It's a very common symptom. That, 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 we can that, talk is, about that. that is just reality. And I think we need to own that. And, and, and you know, that, that can be, hopefully over time. So, you know, I've been a barrister now for about 23 years and you develop a, f- a familiarity. So hopefully I, I remember a barrister once saying to me, I want to get to the stage where I can talk in court as I would talk in my living room and having that. Now I'm not, I'd never, I often say actually when young barristers watch me or people who want to be barristers, when you become a barrister, don't talk to a judge the way I just talked to the judge because I've, you know, been doing it for 23 years and I might know that judge and I've got a, a way of communicating. But um, yeah, so so I think there are those those nerves beforehand and there's that balance between the good anxiety that put, gets you on your A game and that right amount of cortisol, you know, in, in your body, but then, you know, where it can tip over. I think it is true in terms of that drop off after court. Uh, and, you know, if I think over the years of perhaps barristers who struggled with issues, perhaps st- struggled with addiction issues, whether it's sure. alcohol, drug addiction, gambling, though uh, what, I, what I sense is that it's, it's a looking for that adrenaline high that mm. they get in, in the courtroom and dealing with that, that up and down. And I suppose now we can use things like physical practices, uh, both in terms of exercise, you know, uh, other well-being practices that can then help us in relation to that. But I think recognizing that there are these adrenaline highs within what we do, and then perhaps recognizing that are we craving after those things, you know, af- after the event. So, yeah, it, it, it's an important thing to step back and, and reflect on those things. Mm -hmm. It can be very, very addictive. And even those moments where you do pull that all-nighter and you Mm. work nonstop. Although you can say at once, well, those are tough nights, there is something quite addictive about it. That that, Mm. that feeling of being busy, you get hooked on it, right? Because it gives you a, a feeling of importance and, you know, you're being of service. And, of course, as you mentioned, passion being so important and doing something as as noble as a profession Mm. But that's very addictive in itself, isn't it? Yeah, and I think people can also use it as a status symbol. Or I'm very, mm. ask somebody how they're doing. Or I'm very busy. I've been up all night preparing this case. Mm. You know, I, if, you, if you reply, well, actually, my life's quite balanced at the moment. People will be looking at you quite strange. So yeah, <laughs> I think sometimes people can, there is the, as you say, Shalom, the addictive nature of it and, and being addicted to those sort of hormone adrenaline highs, but also then, you know, the status thing of this culture, uh, particularly in the professions of needing to be the hero culture, needing to be the hero and to be busy all the time. Yeah. Mm. How have you navigated those highs and lows? I'm not sure I've been brilliant at it. uh, and, And I don't think, you know, well, all of us, I suppose, as we reflect, you know, for none of us, life is in perfect balance. I, I still think I, I lack enough sleep. Um, for the for the <laughs> for those people who do yoga in the room, everybody will know at the end of yoga, you do something called a shavasana, where you lay in corpse pose. Well, um, I found myself in a yoga class the other night, falling asleep, and and everybody could audibly hear that I'd fallen asleep at the end of the yoga class. So there is that danger, isn't it? So sometimes I, I think I struggle with sleep. And, you know, having two teenage daughters, I think I struggle with balance in terms of of time with them. I think for me, part of my journey has been particularly recognising health challenges. So if I reflect back to probably about a decade ago, so 2012, 2013, I don't think my health was in a good place. I put on a lot of weight uh, and I think that can be a thing, you know, we can use food particularly, you know, as you say, navigating those lows and stresses and times when we are working silly hours, you know, we can use use food, particularly in, in relation to that. My family have a huge amount of, of diabetes. So changing over the last decade how I eat, certainly, and cutting out things like sugar and ultra-processed foods and certain amount of carbs. Now, I know 
diet wars and the right diet is a very controversial thing. And I'm not saying somebody should do a particular thing, but looking after how you eat. I I've, I don't drink and I haven't really ever drunk, but I, I, I'm thinking about people's alcohol consumption is, is a, a challenging thing. Then over recent years, I, I've taken up running so particularly during lockdown, and I find now when I'm not when I'm not in court on so uh, or I'm in court on, at home every morning, I can get out and do my run um, because I'm a achiever. I have to be listening to a podcast at the same time, but that's that's just my own problems. Um, but yeah, so using uh, exercise, you know, trying to switch off at a t- certain time. So I, I think home working perhaps is a challenge to that because in the past. I use chambers as a place where I could go to court and then go and do my preparation. And then when I come home, all right, subject to deadlines and emergencies, but largely you could switch off. Now, I think the challenge for us, you know, I, I'm recording this in my bedroom, but equally in a desk where I work. And that's not a that's not a great thing that there's that merging of of life and work, certainly. So, literally sleeping in the office. Yes, yes, quite. <laughs> quite that we've literally. Now, started sleeping in our office, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the new version of working from home, it's sleeping yeah. in the office. <laughs> and, you know, I'm so glad that you've touched upon the topic of nutrition because one thing that I definitely didn't pay attention to a decade ago because I was part of the club that did that, but now I see it with the new tools that I've acquired along the way and because I've made so many mistakes and, and, and paid the price with my health, is I see this the brilliant, brilliant barristers coming in and out of court and you can walk through this neighborhood in London and you also see them at one o'clock with this, I'm not going to name name, but sandwiches and, and take out coffee and packet of crisps and ultra processed snack bars and I know why they do it because I've done it for years and years and years because for lack of time really Mm. because you have x amount of minute to eat on the go and you don't even sit down so you see them walking around with their lunch how do you feel about that and how can we navigate this as as barristers as solicitors as busy professionals yeah and look It's understandable because people are trying to juggle everything and we appreciate the pressure people are under. But certainly I found when I've cut out those sort of things at lunchtime, you know, we've all experienced that 2 p.m. slump when all of a sudden (laughs) our our head is go. We're trying to read our papers and we find ourselves virtually headbutting the desk, you know, so so we get that that 2 p.m. slump. So I've certainly found um, that for me these days I, I pretty much cut out lunch or I'll just have an apple at lunchtime um, oh. I, I have you know organized breakfast I know some people don't do breakfast but I, I make sure I do do breakfast in order to give me energy for court but also then I won't do lunch and I found by cutting out things like ultra processed food by cutting out sugar now I'm not I, I, I cut, I've cut out sugar completely I wouldn't say that everybody should do that that's a personal choice for me. There was a challenge with diabetes in my family. Mm. Uh, and then that's a, a choice I made. But actually, I find I'm quite a high energy person anyway, but I found my energy throughout the day then is more sustainable. So, you know, you don't get those up and downs. And, and clearly, it affects your mood as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, we've all had those people in the office and you've spoken to them and got growled at back. So it's, yeah, there, there is that, that that thing about your mood and I think food affects mood I I still drink caffeine I've although the coffee I've got this trust me I'm a barrister mug but I've got I love this (laughs) I I do love this so much (laughs) my coffee today is it's actually a London nootropics coffee that's got lion mane lion's mane mushroom and rhodiola so things that are that are cognitive enhancers so there are things we can use that are are safe, legal, uh, and replacements for perhaps caffeine. So, yeah, things to think about and look at. But I've certainly found my my energy has increased, perhaps a better mood as well, uh, and just that that physical health uh, and looking and feeling better, I think, makes such a difference. And and doesn't, you know, that bleeds over, I think, into your professional performance as well. So I I think this is not just woo-woo sort of stuff. This does impact you know in in a real way how you perform in terms of of your professional life 
Absolutely does. How long did it take you, Adam, to get off that sugar, sugar roller coaster <laughs> and to get into this composed, sustainable mood by taking off ultra processed sugar, which I'm, I'm a big advocate of. So I really love that we are touching on that topic. Yeah, it's something probably I gradually did over a few years. Firstly, cutting out, I think it was sugar first, then sort of a lot of the carbs out of out my diet and then changing what I eat. So, and actually I've said the word diet there, you know, seeing things not as a diet, but actually seeing things of this is a way of eating. This is the way I, I fuel my, my mind and body in, in what I do. Uh, and then, so over a couple of years, transitioning the the way I look at food and, and how I eat. So, and it, it's having those small incremental steps that are sustainable over the long term. You know, we're recording this towards the end of the year, we all know what happens in January and people make these huge goals and, and they're laudable and you want to, you know, you want to clap people that they want to make a difference and, and change their habits. But actually, if they're things that are not achievable and sustainable, they're not going to last. And, we, we, you know, we're used to people who perhaps lose a lot of weight and then put it back on because they haven't done it in a sustainable way. And it's finding those things that you can do that that fit with your life and your stage of life you know I, I appreciate you know my, my kids are now teenagers they bring different challenges to somebody who's got toddlers so you know we don't want to be prescriptive somebody maybe say a trainee solicitor uh, has very different pressures and you know you want to give them as much grace as possible just to get you know if they're ordering takeout to the office so be it because they've got to get through that that trainee period so but I uh, but I think you know, implementing those habits that you can sustain over the long term is, is so important. Mm, that idea of sustaining our success, right, which mm. often we don't really reflect on until something happens. <laughs> no, we want the big glamorous change, you know, and, and that's it, it's those small changes. That, you know, I think we've talked before. It's that it's probably a James Clear quote. I'm, I'm going to say it's a James Clear quote because it probably is, but it's those sustained compounding habits over the long term that, that that leads to the massive change and if that's not a James Clear quote we can call it an Adam Pipe quote and I'll have it but yeah <laughs> we quoted from the book Atomic Habits and we'll make sure to add it to the show notes so really really good reference here Adam I, I love I love that I want to take you back to what you mentioned though if you don't mind me going there because I, I appreciate it's quite personal but you did mention that there was a point where you did put on weight and mm. the reason that really caught my attention is whenever I coach barristers Adam that is one of the top three things that they come to see me for you know really optimizing their weight and often what I hear as the number one objection when we on board with the fitness program and this identity this idea of health coaching is but I don't have time and I sit down for many hours every day. Can you tell us what happened? How did you put on that weight? How did you realize you had? And, and what would you tell yourself if you could go back in time? Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? I think using, I've got a sweet tooth, probably using sugar as a, you know, especially like after court, we talk about, you know, how we use food, whether it was comfort eating, I don't know. But man, when you're managing stress, a young family, young children, a, a heavy practice, uh, uh, and then, you know, you end up and a sweet tooth, all those things combined uh, led to that. Now, for other people, it may be that those couple of glasses of wine after court in the evening that, that mm. leads to it and those sort of things. So it's different challenges for different people. But actually, you know, I found that there is. All right. I'm a very organized. I'm a routine pe person. and I think perhaps I've lent into that to, to help with the time to prepare things, you know, to be to be in a position to do that but the upside so outweighs the you know the difficulties of doing that and, and preparing certainly so mm -hmm. I, I think it was a combination of those things so perhaps life stage with family career you know everything that's going on and then you you gradually there's that slippery slope and then I look back at photos or my daughters regularly show me photos of myself to, um, and then you think wow you know I, I, I've let things go so and then using that to make those changes and make the changes both in, in terms of eating, in terms of exercise. And I think, you know, 
particularly we talked a lot about physical health, but the mental health benefits of, you know, exercise, going for a run, you know, doing those things, doing a yoga class, you know, or if it, if it's a gym session, whatever people's interesting, I think, especially when we carry so much stress from our work. So as a barrister, you might carry the stress of, of your client, you know, their, their anxieties about their case. You know, you've got your opponent coming at you, perhaps you've got the judge, you know, laying one on you uh, and you you carry you know those sort of of stresses and actually that that affects you physically and I think probably the cortisol then you know probably makes you put on weight and and, and does that as well so I think using the exercise to burn off that stress as, as, as we cope you know you talk a lot, Charlene, about burnout, and I, I, I want to. Before we get to burnout, we want to burn off that that stress kind of thing. Mm. So using burn off to beat burnout, I think is is so important. Yeah. Tell us more about that. That's a really important topic to talk about. What else do you find that busy professionals could do to burn off that stress that doesn't revolve around those maladaptive coping mechanisms? Well, I think you know, for me exercise is one thing now it's helpful when I'm not in court or I'm in court online I can do that in the morning often because I'm an early bird I, I if I'm in court I'll be in my office in it in, in the city at, at by 7 15 so I'm there early and working because I want to do those hours preparing before court but then it's it's using time after court to make sure you you walk do you know I, I've recently over over recent months I, I've been going out for an evening walk with my youngest daughter and often after the evening meal and often we see walking as you know what's that going to do but actually that walking after a meal when you've got that heavy sluggish feel is now hopefully because you've changed the way you eat you won't get so much of that sluggish heavy feeling but even after a big meal in the evening just going for that 10 or 15 minute walk just to clear your head and maybe it's doing that at I remember I used to watch, and perhaps I hadn't put it joined the dots at that time. I remember watching a judge when I was early in practice, so I'd always see him around the court area at lunchtime going out for a walk. And, and I just thought, oh, that's nice. He goes for a walk. But actually, you know, to get up from our desk, to get some fresh air. I was listening to a podcast today or yesterday about um, mental health and actually the value of light. You know, mm -hmm. our bodies are sort of powered by light and, and you know having that that sunlight you know when I went out for my morning run actually this morning it was dark but actually taking time to get light in our eyes you know I know um I probably I'm sure people listen to Professor Andrew Huberman and his podcast you know one of the big, big, yeah one of the bigger uh, they were all Huberman groupies now and one of the biggest podcasts of recent years but he because he's a vision specialist talks about how particularly as we look at screens all day, our vision narrows and that increases the stress. So actually going, looking at the horizon, changing our, widening our field of vision. So I think incorporating those movement snacks throughout the day, if it's a, a 10 minute walk at lunchtime, if it's just, you know, even if it's just a few minutes breathing, because mm. you know, so often I listened to somebody today saying that often we find ourselves in times of stress, we're holding our breath. And we don't, we don't realize it. So actually taking that time just to, to breathe. For me, yoga has been great. Look, I'm five foot six. I'm not very flexible. I'm not, you know, you see all these yoga flexibility people doing everything. And I look like a numpty a lot of the times. But actually, I find that's really good. And I've, one of the reasons I do yoga is I'm a type A person. And I, I, I'm sure a lot of people listening to your podcast are type A people. I'm an achiever. I like to do things. I'm not one of these hippy dippy yoga people. That's not me. But actually to do something that challenges you and is out of your comfort zone, you know, that that's not something that comes easy for me. I also like, you know, going out and adventuring. So, you know, whether it's climbing in Snowdonia or doing something like that. So to get out, get out of the city, get into the countryside, you know, go and do something that that challenges you uh, and, and pushes you on, on that side. So I think all those things try. And, and again, we want to make it sustainable and something that's, you know, that fits with your life stage at the moment. And, and we recognize that people are at different life stages and facing different challenges as well. And I think, as you mentioned, Adam, it is when we are part of this type A club that we 
are most likely to reject any kind of relaxation technique because who mm. has time for relaxation, right? <laughs> you type A, you're too busy building an empire. You don't have time to relax along the way. But the truth is you're the one that needs it the most because you are constantly prone to go, go, go and not switching your mind off and, and being constantly chasing the next goal and the next win, right? At least for me, I can yeah. really say that I had developed an addiction to to the win. I'm not talking games here. I've never <laughs> gamed or, or cast note, but I'm talking about the thrill of winning as a litigator, just that feeling of winning. It just is so exhilarating. It, really, you can feed off that quite a lot. And can you tell us a bit about that desire to, to win and how they can have a positive impact on our mental health, but also perhaps how it can have a negative impact if not kept at bay? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Can I just take a step back a, a minute? When you were just saying something, I... I, I it reminded me of something that I don't, you know, we talk about taking breaks, but actually I don't do well on days off. <laughs> and I don't know if a lot of people, you know, know about that. I think a lot of people perhaps find their purpose in their work. And then when, perhaps if there's a day I'm not in court and I haven't got busy things to do, or sometimes on weekends, or even if I got time out and we're not away, Perhaps I'll struggle with those days because I, you know, I, I'm somebody who needs to be doing something all the time. And perhaps sometimes we can find so much purpose. And I, I think a lot of people find their sense of identity in their work and their profession that when they those things are not there, that they really struggle in those situations. And I think for me, it's a constant battle and challenge to be reflecting on that and actually you know, because I always want to be achieving and ticking things off. And that's, mm. you know, a valuable, you know, day for me without, I've, you know, I've got the list there with ticking those things off the list and feeling like I've, you know, done everything. But actually, you know, realizing that sitting on the sofa next to my daughters watching Netflix actually is, is, is as important and as, you know, important for them, but also important for me and refuels me in a, in a different way that, you know, those emotional tanks as well. Just leading to your winning point, I suppose, yeah, it's, it's interesting. As a lawyer, I've not, it's not one of those things that I always, well, you do, perhaps I'm not admitting it, you do want to win, don't you? You do, I, yeah. Um, I think for me, it's not a win at all costs, is it? For us, I think one of our values, particularly as a barrister, you know, is to act with integrity at all times and to fight your client's case to the best of your ability while maintaining scrupulous ethical standards and walking that ethical tightrope. And I think sometimes when people get pushed too far, that's when they can make compromises in their professional life in terms of ethical decisions and not just lawyers, you know, other professions. When we're pushed too far into that win at all cost mentality, I think mm. that's when we can make those decisions that are not good profession. I think that's when it's so important to have that, that those colleagues around you so you can you know if somebody if thinks you're pushing too far can say oh have you just thought about this and pull you back a bit I think that that that's so important but also recognizing that I'm not my client's case mm. you know, in the end it's my client's case I'm not their case all I can do is is put their case now some of them weigh heavily upon me you know, especially when you're dealing with people who've suffered significant trauma, you know, there is that pressure upon you to, to win their case because, you know, the, the implications for them might be huge. And I know it's interesting, some work has been done, particularly around, among immigration lawyers, about the whole notion of vicarious trauma, that you're, by dealing with so much trauma, you know, you can, in, in fact, imbibe that within yourself and it can affect you and I think that's so much that's why it's so important as we've talked about you know burning off that stress that also the the trauma that when you're you're dealing with clients dealing with these traumatic situations dealing with litigation which is often about conflict that you are recognizing the, the impact that those things have upon you and how do you find yourself putting measure in place to not only keep your 
client psychological safety levels up, but also maintain yours while you serve them in the best possible way, because that sometimes can be very difficult. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> it is a difficult and it's rec- I think the first thing is to recognize that challenge, isn't it? That, you know, to, to, and to try and keep balance to, to be representing your clients as best as possible, but to recognize that impact upon you, to surround yourself with colleagues, family and friends who can recognize those early warning signals and, you know, where things perhaps are get, getting too much and Im- impacting you, you know, to take time into your life for, you know, things like exercise, things like various practices, you know, to, to spend time with family and friends. Now, it's not something that any of us, and I, I, I'm no expert on that, and it's a constant battle, isn't it, with, with all of us, but it's perhaps just that constant reminding and, and recognising those things, yeah. I think you're being perhaps a bit too humble, Adam, if I may say so. Uh, the reason I say that is because the way we met originally or began to entertain our professional um, relationship is rather unusual since we met through the love of biohacking. Absolutely. So the reason I say you are perhaps too humble when you say you are no expert, I do not know so many barristers, Adam, who know as much about biohacking as you do. <laughs> yes. Perhaps that's just a bit about my obsessive personality and all, you know, all these things. But yeah, no, I remember, I think we first, oh, I first met you probably virtually because I listened to a talk mm-hmm. you gave at one of the biohackers summit. Um, In Finland. By- in Finland, yeah, and mm. you were talking, there was this former lawyer talking about how we should eat organ meat, and I thought that was fantastic, you know, so, <laughs> yeah, no, and, and you know, I'm not saying everybody should do the habits that I do, but actually to investigate, are there things we could use that could help us both health-wise, mental health-wise, and also professionally improve our performance so I'm not saying everybody has to jump in with me every month in a cryotherapy chamber or do some of the others. I'm happy to chat Another about kind of chamber. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, From chamber I'm, to chamber. <laughs> I'm happy to talk about any of those. But I think, yeah, about use, utilizing those things that are available uh, to both improve your performance because, you know, we all want to be high performance and performing at our best, but also not sacrificing our health and well-being and actually seeking to to maximize so maximizing performance but also at the same time maximizing health and well-being and what drew you to begin with to biohacking because i've met you there as i was speaking at the summit and i wonder because it's a question i've never had a chance to ask you before what was the appeal how did you find out about biohacking I suppose on on the journey of of health and, and you know trying to improve my own health you know trying to lose weight, get fitter, then you, through podcasts, through YouTube, finding out about various practices and then signing up to listening to conferences and then having a go, whether it's then through cold water, through breath work, through all, all those different things. So, and then it's been a gradual journey and then this whole whole new world opens up. Now, for some people, uh, you know, I, I, I recognise that it can go the other way as well. You get those... Uh, you know, people. I recently I went to the Health Optimization Summit. Great, great summit. But for some of them, that's their religion. That's their their fervor. And you know, for all of these things, we want to hold them in balance. You know, for me, the challenge is every new practice I take up. I think I've got to add it on. So my morning routine and my nighttime routine probably take twenty three and a half hours, and there's not much day left. <laughs> <laughs> So I think, uh, Especially if you're listening to the amazing Ben Greenfield podcast or other, right. quite right, then you're listening to Ben Greenfield, you're listening to Andrew Uberman, and you're doing your routine. Mm. <laughs> and for them, you appreciate for that, that's their job. But for us, you know, it's trying to use those things that also facilitate and aid and, and lift up the, the work we're doing as professionals as well. Um, yeah, certainly. So, yeah, I, I recognise that to have that imbalance and to use those things that help people. And often, I think biohacking can be a bit 
white and middle class as well. Um, you know, that, that it, it's things, there are things that are, some of the best biohacks are free, you know, and, and it's doing those things that are available to all and perhaps, you know, implementing all of them. Well, not everybody, Adam, has attended several biohacking summits like we have. So tell, talk us to what being a biohacked barista means in your world. Maybe walk us through some of your natural biohacks or what biohacking has done to your life. How do you integrate it? What are some of your biohacking habits or behavior? Oh, now that's, yeah, that's a really good one. So let's start with with cold. I think uh, I mentioned cryotherapy. So that's something I've introduced recently, but also probably the, 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 the zero cost version and perhaps saving money with the, the, the price of utilities at the moment is is cold showers. So for the last handful of years, I've only taken cold showers, which has been fantastic. And actually, if you're looking... Only? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a. I will have a hot bath in the evening to relax. Uh, but uh, but the only shower I have is is completely cold. So I don't want to think to people I never get in warm water. But um, yeah, cold showers have been fantastic. Now, if anybody's thinking that's not accessible, you know, there's the contrast showers where you may do thirty seconds warm, thirty seconds cold, or perhaps the last thirty seconds of your shower cold. And I think that you know that. That wakes you up. I, I, I think it also I think speeds up your metabolism. There's that dump in your body of feel good hormones. So you actually get addicted to it. And there's also that thing about doing hard things. I think one of the things is that when we have these stressors in our lives, so biohacking sometimes can be there can be stressors in our lives. So going in a cold shower is quite a challenging thing, a stressful thing. But the fact you've conquered that, I think, helps you deal with stressful situations better yeah. Yeah. because you're used to dealing with that and, and overcoming challenges as well that you, you know, you go forward thinking, wow, I, I've achieved something, even something as silly as getting in a cold shower. So for me, you know, often my mornings will look like um, going downstairs early, doing some exercise while listening to something uplifting but also then drinking so hydration so many people professionals are, are, are dehydrated uh, and that affects their mood and performance Je, you know and I'll often put some supplements in my, my water and then what do you like to put in your water now, in water I, I take a mixture now I, I take lots of things in in my water I, I, I often use something like spirulina so mm -hmm. a, a, a yes. powder um, I'll use um, pine pollen. So mm -hmm. for men, that's quite good hormonally. I think a lot of men, particularly, I, I'm in my 40s, you see a lot of men, you can tell by their bodies, by their posture, by their demeanor, they're lacking in testosterone. So yes. I think things that improve your testosterone has multiple benefits. What else do I put in that? Uh, um, some baobab powder, which is high in vitamin C. So that, you know, that that's great. And then I'll also often use a, a blend of medicinal mushrooms, which is, is very helpful. So, yeah, those, those kind of things. Um, if I'm at home, I'll then, you know, go out for a, for a run. I tend to run about five and a half K, so about 30 minutes or so in the morning. So it's just a, a local route. But it's time you can listen to a podcast as well or, you know, Perhaps that's not a good thing. I, I need to challenge myself about do I always need to be listening to a podcast when I'm going running? And sometimes, I, you know, you miss the wonder of nature when you're listening to a podcast. So for some people, I've been challenged recently about how much time I spend actually having no sensory input. I think for a lot of us, um, I'd like to, one of my next biohacks, perhaps I found in Birmingham, there is a place that does flotation tanks. Oh, and I it, love those. I'm and if you listen fan. to people like Joe Rogan and knows about flotation tanks, but I've yet to have a go. But a lot of us have that sensory overload, whether mm. it's through, you know, I, you know, for me, social media has been brilliant as a lawyer, you know, because through posting legal updates on Twitter and LinkedIn and, and after this podcast recording, now I've made a note, there's a, a new case came out and I thought, well, I must share that. So, yeah, I'll use that. But often, how much time in the day are we not getting sensory inputs and that's causing us to be stressed and not have that time? We talked about burning off stress just where we're, we're settling a bit. So actually, that's so maybe for, for people listening, it might be going for a walk or going for a run without listening to anything. And, you know, what is it? Is it the Japanese who talk about forest bathing? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, just, 
to the listen. benefit to of the sound of nature, right? Drops your cortisol yeah. level down, your stress hormone. I'll, I'll also use some of my biohacking things. I, I use an infrared uh, light device as well. I, um, I, I've got one, like a belt kind, a kind of one, not a panel, and I'll use that every day. I Helps love it. A, mm-hmm. a stiff back so you know i think that that helps and i, I think that energizes you as well uh, I, i'll also use i tell you what i love and people who struggle sleeping is an acupressure mat mm. now um like so for 10 minutes before going to sleep i'll lie in an acupressure mat uh, and then uh, you just find yourself at first it's a bit uncomfortable but you find yourself melting into it and it's so de-stresses helps your muscles and helps you sleep. So anybody who struggles with sleep, have a look at an acupressure mat. I started with a plastic one. It actually has got literal metal nails on the one I use now. So it's pretty hardcore. Don't don't start there. And then then things like before bed, using things like a, having a drink of reishi mushroom. So perhaps stopping your caffeine earlier in the day and using other things that naturally relax people so i find using drinking some reishi mushroom before bed is fantastic sometimes i use things like cbd oil as well Uh, and then in terms of biohacking as i've said i I, I, once a month i'll do some cryotherapy not not through anything i know some people will use that in terms of particular health challenges for me it's just trying to be the best i can and also i've tried some hyperbaric oxygen therapy in the same thing i've only done that a couple of times but i know People who perhaps lack energy and recovery have a look into that hyperbaric oxygen therapy because going in the pressure chamber, breathing in the oxygen speeds the healing process and helps, you know, your brain and body in terms of energy. So lots of things to explore there. Mm, Absolutely. And one thing that I get a lot when coaching clients on biohacking journey is the um, initial beginner's journey overwhelm. Mm. Uh, oh, I'm hearing a lot of new things and half of them are words that I never knew before. Where do I begin? Where do I start? And I love the fact that you actually took us through a journey that, of course, has some element of gadgets and, and toys and things that are quite advanced in terms of technology, but also some that are just nature, like being in the garden, going to the park, being in silence, grounding, taking your shoes off. I travel all the time and one of the first things I do when I land is just take my shoes off and ground because I know that I can feel a lot calmer and it will help me with my jet lag as well and I think there is a tendency to perhaps want to 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 run before we can walk when it comes to biohacking so I've had a a client recently that got overly excited because their first acquaintance to biohacking was going to one of those clinic and going into the hyperbaric chamber which i think is fantastic mm. but the person in question had never once practiced breath work <laughs> and to me and again i am not saying don't go and 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 use the clinic because i love those clinics i mm. go on a monthly basis and i have a huge amount of friends in those clinic and i think they're phenomenal but again what well, before you run. And I think that comes back to this Taipei. Have you found as well that biohacking does attract the Taipei because we want more results, faster, shinier, bigger, right? So of course it's very, very attractive for that reason. Yeah. What's your take on this? And can you relate to some of the things no, that you're just saying? I think you're spot on that, you know, th- those, and I'm sure a lot of your clients are like this, they're high performing work wise, they want to be the best there. And similarly, then when they hear about this world of health optimization and biohacking, they want to go head first into that. And I suppose if there was a, a theme running through some of the things we've talked about today, one of the things obviously I said in terms of diet and health and implementing change in those sustainable steps things that are sustainable and it's those compounding of those small habits as we said that leads to change so yeah if people want to experiment and try those things fantastic but actually you know on a daily basis it's free to have a cold shower to have a glass of water in the morning and at lunchtime and in the evening is is free to go for a walk and have a movement break is free and just incorporate it's not sexy it's not the latest technology but actually it's the things that are sustainable and will compound over the long term 
Mm. So, you know, just incorporating those things. And actually, you know, it's that, that's what we want. I, I'm just reflecting now. Um, I'm at my standing desk at the moment, and that's something I've incorporated. And, just, and I think I communicate better standing up. And I've started doing it for online uh, court uh, things. And tomorrow I'm teaching a three-hour seminar. Now, I'll see how good I am for standing for three hours and talking, but we'll, we'll see. But, but, but I find that helps. So, you know, movement hydration you know cold breathing all free not sexy but compound over time to make a huge difference and without decimating your wallet in the meantime but there are those and view the other things as the the cream on top you know the other things can be the additional but it's those sort of things that'll that'll be be sustainable Mm. And I think it's quite interesting that for many of us, sometimes when it seems easy, it seems not powerful. So if I say to a client, well, walk every day before logging in and after logging off, like you mentioned, that amazing walk that you do with your daughter, Mm. that goes a long way. Not just your mental health, your physical health, your step count, your digestive health. Mm. And not even touching upon the quality of your relationship with your daughter, which yeah, perhaps is <laughs> the first thing to, 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 to speak of. But somehow there is still this idea that, as you mentioned, if it hasn't been expansive or if it hasn't been done in a fancy setting, then perhaps it's not quite sexy enough. <laughs> no, no, 100%. And I think sometimes particularly perhaps professionals who are money rich but time poor, they think if you throw some money at something, that's going to get you results. So if you spend X amount to jump in a hyperbaric chamber or to be frozen in a cryotherapy chamber, you've sorted it. But actually, it's the disciplined habits over time that make the difference, which is not about throwing money at something. It's about actually changing our lives and and what we do on a day-to-day basis it's it's the things that that that, that make the real difference it it goes back to those january new year's resolutions people all want to make these giant resolutions but actually it's the small sustainable things compounding over time that that make the difference and then yes use the fun things on top of that and you don't have to do everything you know my danger is once i start something if I don't do it, I feel guilty. Um, mm. <laughs> yeah, somebody somebody said I, I've got orthopraxy or something like that that I I, I can't I, I mustn't stop doing it. But yeah, uh, and, <laughs> and we, we find those things that are that are helpful to us uh, and that are sustainable. But actually, yeah, it might not be the expensive, sexy things that we all singing or dancing. It, it's those day to day practices that that we can implement in our lives. And I think beyond that, there is also a lure sometimes when we are time poor but financially abandoned to want to money to solve some problems that we think money will solve, but actually they create bigger problem. And one of the prime examples that comes to my mind was just coming from a coaching session a few weeks back where one of my clients, very, very successful, but struggling with chronic back pain and navigating weight gain <laughs> was telling me how he hired this dog walker um, because he was living in New York City and had no time. So got a new puppy, hired the dog walker and was moaning about weight and, and, and fatigue and also how naughty the puppy was and it was not very well behaved. And I was just thinking, huh, what if? Just, just <laughs> let, let's play right with this. <laughs> what if your coaching homework today was to sack the dog walker (laughs) and become your own puppy walker. What if we were to foster that strong bond with your puppy and make sure you get your 10,000 steps a day and we kill many birds with that one stone? And it just came like a bit of a ha-ha moment, which was the most simple advice. But I think we all have a tendency sometimes to want to fix problem by throwing money at it, but mm. is that addressing the root cause? And and one of the things that he said to me, which I found very interesting, was, "Oh no, I don't have time." I said, "Is that really so? Is it is it time? Is the real reason you don't want to walk the puppy time?" And then he said, "No, I'm lazy. 
And then I said, is that so? Because you do so much hard things at work. Mm. Very, very successful professional. And I found it so interesting that someone who could achieve so much and be nothing but lazy, yet could self-describe as lazy when it came to exercise. <laughs> wow. Yeah, just so much there, I think. One of the phrases that keeps coming back to my mind, as you say, is, uh, I don't know where it's from, it's do not despise the day of small things. And, you know, sometimes we look for the big things, but actually it's those those small things that, that make a difference. And you talk about throwing money at things. Actually, if you want to know what you value, look at your bank statement, because that is a true reflection of where your values lie uh, mm. and what we do. And, and yes, there is, you know, if health is important and wellness and you can afford it. And obviously I recognize there's huge challenges for people financially. And that, that's where I've tried to emphasize the things that are no cost. Do invest money in your health and well-being because that is so important and that that shows you know we do value it yeah i don't i don't buy when he says he's lazy and respected that it, I, I think it comes down to priorities and what you what you really want to do yeah but also adam i think that brings us back to the point that you made earlier on that when you are burning out and and definitely that individual was burning out and that's the reason he wanted to be coached by me you actually get less inclined to do hard things yeah. in your personal life because you do have to climb mountains at work because you're constantly on the go. You struggle from decision fatigue because all you do all day long is solve and fix and work and yeah. perform. Yeah. So it's not that you become lazy. It's that you become exhausted from doing so much that you're looking to save that little energy that you've got left. And that makes complete sense because all of that energy, all of that amazing self has gone to work. What do you have left? Yeah, there's a couple of things there you say. I think um, I think the do hard things, do hard things is so important. I want to, in my personal life, do hard things. I think that um, was it, is that uh, I want to get their T-shirt. There's that YouTube channel, the Yes Theory, you do chat, and they've got that T-shirt, Seek Discomfort. Mm. We, we should all have some discomfort in our lives. Recently, I was scrambling in Sodonia, and there's nothing like when you look down the other side and there's nothing there but cliff edge to get your heart going. But when you, after you've done it, you feel like you've achieved so much and it equips you to do so much more because you faced your fears you face those those challenges. So I think the do hard things is so important. You talked about decision fatigue. You know, my family sometimes take the mick out of me, but actually having routines and habits is so good that you're, you know, everybody knows the examples of, you know, Steve Jobs dressing in the same outfit every day. Yeah. But, you know, cutting out those things that drain us of, of, of mental energy so we don't have to waste that mental energy because we're recognizing that in our work and our profession that that's so draining. And just coming back to that thing about preferring to throw money and do big things, I'd actually dug out a quote for today, and I thought I was going to tell you this quote in relation to being an advocate. But actually, the quote is this, is, is simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Mm. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Now, it's a Leonardo da Vinci quote, and I was prepared to talk to you today about the art of the advocate in communication so and it's right in relation to that if, if somebody wants to be better in terms of public speaking communicating or court advocacy sometimes people want to try these sophisticated you know using as big a word as you can it's actually simplicity is the key but actually when we've talked about biohacking and maximizing our performance in all areas of our lives it's this life of simplicity of, of of simple habits that we build up and have that compound effect so yeah I, I didn't think I'd be using that quote um in relation to that but yes yeah, so, so simplicity is the ultimate sophistication it's uh, true for advocacy and definitely true for health as well absolutely and perhaps that is the perfect opportunity for us to tell us a little bit more about this very very special skill that you have with advocacy and what it takes to build that extraordinary skill over the years and perhaps for you to share some insights 
as it is something that is most people's biggest fear, <laughs> publicly speaking. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm always suspicious when people say after death, the biggest fear people have is is public speaking. But certainly, you know, it, it's definitely something that uh, people are uh, afraid of and I think challenges so many, many people. So I, I, I think and it's something that develops like any skill over time and through experience. And if, if you're somebody who wants to develop not everybody's going to be a want to be a lawyer, but improve your communication skills. It's having a go. It's it's taking those classes, perhaps, and then putting yourself. In, we've talked about doing hard things, putting in your putting yourself in situations where you do uh, have to communicate. Then and then get feedback on what you do. I, I think preparation and practice is important. You know, for, as a lawyer, you're always you need to know your brief. You know, I need to be on top of the facts of the case. And often I see in cases where somebody, my client will be questioned about something, but that's not exactly right. And I can jump in and say, ah, that's not right, that question and point to something in the evidence which shows because I know the case better than my opponent. So preparation is is so important, as is is practice. So for people giving talks in public and public speaking don't be afraid to literally I've done it with family members I've recorded myself actually practice giving your your talk and there's nothing as excruciating as watching yourself yeah. back and you it's I, I remember at, at, at law school having to do advocacy classes and videoing yourself doing short bits of advocacy and being mortified at the, the way you speak or certain gestures and yeah, so preparation and practice, I think, is so important. But also, let's stick with my P's then. We'll talk about passion and personality. Hopefully something across I came across today in all that I've said is the passion for what I do. And, and, and I think for when you're communicating, you know, we've all been to those talks where people are not passionate about what they're speaking on and just you want the stage to open up and <laughs> like a trap door and take them <laughs> off the stage or, you know, so, and, and you know, my other quote, this made me laugh today. We'll, we'll, we'll play a game, Charlene. Can you tell me who this quote is from? Mm. I like the, I love this quote. Without passion, you don't have energy. Without, without energy, you have nothing. Can you guess who that quote is from? Without passion, you don't have energy. Without energy, you have nothing. Mm. It's actually from, Donald J. Trump. So you know, now, whenever I'm quoting somebody I don't agree with, I'll just say, as one author said, so as one <laughs> author said, without passion, you don't have energy. And without energy, you have nothing. And I think, I think communicating with passion is, is so important. Now, that has to be measured. The way I'll speak on a stage communicating about something is different to how I'll speak in court. I'll speak in a way that's appropriate to the situation I'm dealing with. Uh, and obviously in court, I may temper that in the way I speak. I'll, I'll be no less passionate about my case, but it'll be, you know, targeted to your audience. So I think knowing your audience is so important. You know, doing your research about who you're speaking to, what their background is, it, it is so important. And I said passion and personality, you know, being you, there is so... You know, there are some brilliant advocates out there. I could watch a video of a top QC speaking or no, we're not QCs anymore. They were King's Council, not Queen's Council. So top KC speaking and try and imitate them. And that wouldn't be authentic. And that wouldn't be me. Now, that's not to say we're to settle with ourselves and not try and improve how we communicate. We always want to be clear in how we communicate and communicate in the, the most effective way, but also in our own personality. So it's passion, but in our own personality. There may be great TED Talks that people watch, or you may go to a, a conference or a summit and hear a, a John Maxwell or a Simon Sinek or somebody like that speak and think, I want to speak like that. But actually, it's about your personality and bringing your authentic personality uh, with passion. And I, I suppose the final piece then is presence and presentation, how we come across our, our presentation in, in how we use our voice, you know, having light and shade. 
there are that I, you know there's those monotonous monologues from what is it what's that phrase a monotonous monologue from a moron to a moot and that's what <laughs> we don't want we you know we want some modulation in the way we speak to use body language now you can probably see i speak with my hands but actually in court sometimes that could be distracting so trying to think do i need to reduce where i use my hands and and you know bod thinking about how we use our body language but also how we use our voice when we need to speed up when we need to slow down so earlier on i talked to you about challenges about addictions and different things that barristers face and i deliberately slowed down when i talked to you about that and i was conscious there was a conversation going on in my mind oh i need to slow down at this point because mm -hmm. i'm coming to something serious and something i want people to hold on to so uh, that's just that's just sort of my personal philosophy in terms of people if they want to improve how they communicate either in a formal setting or an informal setting think about how you prepare and practice think about your own passion and personality but think of also about your presence uh, and your presentation how you come across and that that also is how you appear how you stand how you you know and and I know when people are fearful when they come on stage to give a presentation they'll grab onto that lectern and they won't move where actually I'll always, if you ever see me speaking and there's a lectern, I'll always move the lectern to the side so there's never a physical barrier between myself and the audience. Now, the opposite of that is somebody who doesn't stop moving. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, you've seen people walk up and down and you're feeling seasick during their talk, where actually something, certain points, there's a point about standing still and being very clear and direct in what you speak. So you using those sort of things. So that's perhaps an advocate's perspective and some thoughts about how people can improve their, their public speaking. And hopefully that's helpful uh, to your listeners in terms of how they can develop that area of, uh, of their professional life or, or even personal life, because so much more. And, and then we have to think about how we do that online as well now, that there is a online public speaking is a different skill that needs to be mastered as well. So actually, I might use my hands more online and I'm deliberately standing up when I'm talking to you now because I want energy to come across mm. because, you know, when I'm talking to a room of a couple of hundred people, I'll increase my volume and I'll increase my gestures. But how do I do that when there's a couple of hundred people watching me online? And so, so to think about how we modulate our communication when we're doing that in an online setting as well, I think that's so important. It is. And it ties mm. in so well as well with all that we've spoken about around biohacking and sustaining health. Because in the P's of preparation that you mentioned in all your P's for advocacy, what I'm hearing and what really echoes reflecting on some of the struggle that I hear in our world is the fact that in that P for preparation, I see a lot of professionals put all those hours for the intellectual preparation. So all the content is ready. All the knowledge is there. All the facts are there. But what I see happening a lot and what people come to see me for is all that they neglect to get the facts and to get the data and to get the knowledge. And that's often the body, the mm. mind, the mindset, the body yeah. language you spoke about, so important. Because if you have spent the night before going to court, going to a boardroom, going perhaps, you know, you're not a barrister, you're not a lawyer, you have C-suite or any other form of presentation or pitching and, and your preparation beyond the intellectual preparation at a physical and mindset level was working and burning the midnight oil on your desk, eating delivery, watching TV to relax and having all these artificial blue lights, sacrificing sleep, having a terrible diet, having triple espresso the morning of the presentation, there is probably going to be quite a tangible impact <laughs> on the quality of your pitch presentation or advocacy. What are your I, thoughts here? A hundred percent in terms of now, I know it might be easy to say sleep well before a presentation. Some people are very nervous, so I understand that, yeah, that sleep might be affected, but certainly sleep will affect your performance. I've talked a couple of times today about hydration. If people are dehydrated, their brain is not going to work uh, as well. Uh, and then just 
physically, I, I always remember Tony Robbins saying about, you know, before he gets up and speaks for seven hours, he's on one of those mini trampolines behind yeah, the stage. Yeah, rebounder. <laughs> yeah, on the rebounder, just to get your body moving, get that lymph flowing. Uh, and, you know, I know, is it the work of Amy Cuddy on yes. with the Ted and power posing? Just there the physical. Go. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I, will, I, I do find my, and I know there's been, controversy about whether that does affect your hormonal balance or whatever but actually I'll do will find myself at the back of a room before giving a talk actually just you know because if we've been sat down like that and then we get up on stage and we're giving a talk like that it's not going to come across very well where if actually our we've made our bodies big we can help you know project and it is you know communication and advocacy is an energy transfer yeah. and and you know how, how, if our energy is low you know, both in terms of physical, mental, emotional, if those if those batteries are low, our communication is going to be very low energy. And it doesn't mean you have to be very excitable like me. You know, there may be very different ways of doing it and still communicating in a powerful way, because often I think it's about, you know, there's that famous quote, and I'm probably butcher, it's not how, what you tell somebody, but it's how you make them feel. And a lot of communication is how you make you know, somebody feel and say from a from an advocate's perspective, I want a judge to feel when I start speaking in court, a sense of relaxed. Oh, this person has done their prep. They know what they're talking about. I can listen to this person and actually they relax and they think, right, I'm in safe hands. So I want, you know, that that's something perhaps in in my professional communication, I, I want to communicate. And then perhaps if I'm giving a talk to solicitors, updating them on the law, I want them to think, oh, He's excited about this. He's, he, 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 you know, he's keen about this subject. I want them to get enthused about it and think, right, he, he knows his stuff, but actually he's very keen to communicate that to us and, and feel that energy and then get people enthused about w what you're talking about. Um, yeah, yeah and, and often I think about when people give you compliments in relation to your communication, I think a lot is down. I wonder sometimes if I, if I could get up on stage and say a load of gibberish, but I say it in a way that makes people feel good that actually they'll, because you make them feel good, they'll still love what you say. And I think it's so much in, it, not in actually what you're saying, but, but that is so important, but actually how you make people Absolutely. feel and, and the energy you're communicating to them. Absolutely. I believe in that wholeheartedly. And I think, Adam, you've demonstrated that with excellent skills throughout this recording. So really um thank you for not only talking us through these special skills but actually demonstrating them to us throughout yeah. this no thank you charlene it's, it's so it's great actually to get a chance to reflect on these things because sometimes those of us who are perhaps these type a doer people don't spend enough time reflecting I, I don't know any i don't know any. <laughs> you know whoever they are those those strange beings but, but, but when I knew we were going to talk today and the sort of questions that were coming up, I thought, ooh, and it, and it forces me to reflect. And even one of these skills we want people to go away to is just to take out time to reflect on some of these questions. And, and I think, you know, about what people's passions are, what they're doing in, in their lives to, to keep their energy high, to maintain their physical well-being, to maintain those mental well-being, to take that time out. You know, whether it's over a holiday period, whether it's just taking some time, whether it's on a 10 minute walk to reflect on these things, you know, so we can go forward to be the best we can be professionally, but also not to burn out or blow up. But, but you know, to combine, you know, the physical, mental uh, and emotional well-being alongside professional high performance. Mm. Thank you, Adam, for sharing all of that wisdom with us today. And Perhaps if our audience would like to get to know you and your practice more and get familiar with this incredible channels that you've put together, could you tell us a little bit more about where they might be able to connect with you? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure you'll put my links uh, with the podcast so people can sign up to the YouTube channel. There's lots of immigration law on there, uh, but also there are other interesting conversations. And if you track back, you can do that 20 minute yoga session. It's very easy. And if you just need something to wind down in the evening, just go and find it on my YouTube channel and do it. Listen to the conversations I had with Charlene. People can connect with me through through Twitter, or am I supposed to call it X these X. days, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever Elon wants me to say, uh, and through LinkedIn, I'm very active there. So um, sh 
I'm sure Charlene will put the details to those and it'll be great if anything I can if anything I do helps other people you know that that's fantastic and and that'll be great so yeah no I, I'd encourage people to connect in in those ways thank you so much Adam and is there one thought mantra affirmation anything at all that you would like to leave our audience with being the biohack barrister that you are <laughs> Yeah, well, I think one of the things I've come back to today is is about passion. So I'd encourage people to refine their professional passion, and perhaps for those who've lost that, to, and that might involve changes. But but look about what where your passion lies. But also then, you know, to find those tools that we've talked about, and maybe not the super sexy, expensive knobs and flashing lights but those those other simple tools that you can that that simplicity being the ultimate sophistication that you can add those simple tools to improve all areas of your life thank you adam i really appreciate your time and i look forward to connecting with you at another biohacking summit i'm sure absolutely amongst others thanks Thank you for spending your time with me today and listening to this episode. Remember to subscribe so that you can receive weekly updates. And if today's message resonated with you, please remember to share it with a friend, a colleague or a loved one who could really benefit from this episode.